start. OK, awesome. So before we get started talking about the Constitution today, I have two reminders that are related to the Constitution. So. Reminder number one. The census is happening uh, and they've extended the deadline to October 5th. So if you've not completed the census, remember the census counts all people in living in the United States. So it doesn't matter if you're a citizen or an immigrant, if you're documented, undocumented, they're not going to ask you your immigration status. They just want to know, do you live in the United States? So check to see if somebody in your household has already filled out the census. Great. You don't have to do it. Only one person per household needs to fill it out, give the information to everybody living there. If you have not done it yet, hop to it. You can do it online. So this is the census website um, and you can see uh, it's real easy to go ahead and uh, find on how to do the perform. You don't have to send it back, um, but you have until October 5th, which is I believe is the next Monday. Okay. Um, the Constitution actually specifically requires a census. Uh, article, I think it's Article 2, Section 1, uh, requires the census. Why do we need to bother to count uh, the people living in the United States? Any ideas? Why do we do a census every 10 years? Why does the Constitution require us to do a census every 10 years? Anybody know? Well, yes, taxing people is important, right? Revenue, cash flow. There are other reasons. As, as well as taxing, there's also an idea of like who lives where to kind of distribute government funds, right? But there's one other really big reason. And if you can Google the Constitution and tell me what Article 2 is about, that'll give you a big clue. What is Article 2 about? Got it in the population so we can do what? Article 2, Section 1. And is related to voting, right? So specifically, the census is about figuring out representation, right? Because as we're going to learn about today, what body in Congress is the number of seats a state gets based on population? You remember? There's only two options. You have 50% chance, right? The House of Representatives is based on the population, right? So that's why we do the census every 10 years. So if a state gains populations, they might gain seats. If they lose populations, they might lose seats. OK, so that's section one. Section two is right here. OK, oh, no, that's article two. All right, so this is why it's important to fill out the census, because we want to make sure that we have adequate representation in the House of Representatives. It's also really important for voting because whoever we vote in this year in this election in 2020 are the people in charge of redrawing the map based on population, redrawing the electoral map. So really important to pay attention to who you're electing to the state legislature because each state's in charge of redrawing their map based on the census. All right, the second reminder I have for y'all is registering to vote. OK, raise your hand if you are already registered to vote. Do I have anybody who's already registered? No, OK, raise your hand if you are not eligible to vote. Do you know what the eligibility is? You have to be 18 or turning 18 by the election. And you have to be a citizen in the United States. That's pretty much it. All right, so we have a couple people who are not quite 18 yet, I'm guessing. Close, but not quite. I feel you. I turned 17 a month before uh, the 2000 election. I've just told you how old I am. Uh, and it was really frustrating that I could not vote in that election. All right. Is anybody eligible to vote but not registered yet? So you're 18, you're a citizen of the United States. Anybody eligible but not registered? All right, Esmeralda. I'm assuming you're in Texas, Esmeralda and Cami. Y'all are in Texas? 
Yes, nod yes, or type yes if you are. If you are in Texas, you can go to this website and I'll go ahead and I'll put it up in announcements uh, in our class. And you can literally fill out the questions that the voter registration form asks. And then this website will let you print it and mail it in. Okay, so you can register to vote by this way. Texas ha again has the deadline of October 5th. You can't register to vote online, but you can fill out the form online, okay, through the Secretary of State's website in Texas, and then print it out and mail it in. In order to register for the November election, you have to be um, have to stick this in the mail by October 5th. So it has to be postmarked by October 5th. They don't have to receive it by October 5th. And if you're paranoid about the post office because it's been slow, you can always go and drop it off uh, at the county uh, elections office, which is in the county courthouse. Okay. If you have any questions about uh, voting or how to go ahead and register, let me know. Um, I have been a deputy voter registrar. Um, so I am trained in how to help people register. All right. So I went ahead and I shared that information because it is relevant to the Constitution that we're talking about today. So let's go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint. There it goes. All right. Yes, I'm going to replace this. Okay, thinking about life. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the Constitution. Um, I realize that you all have to take government, right? Uh, and you learn some of this stuff, but we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Constitution, why certain things are the way they are in the Constitution. So a little bit different take than you get in a government class. All right, so as we talked about a little bit last class, right? One of the myths that we talked about the American Revolution was that the Constitution was the first version of government. And as we said last week, it is not, right? There was a version of government before the Constitution called the Articles of Confederation. Okay, that was the government in place uh, during the Revolution because it was created during the Revolution, but in terms of when the United States becomes independent, right? When the war with Britain ends, 1781. Okay, so that's when it's officially ratified as the first government of the new United States. The confederation, a confeder confederation, as we mentioned last week, is a word that doesn't mean like confederacy. Um, when we talk about the Civil War, a confederation is a very sort of loose organization together of states. So what this means is there's no strong central government. And you can see that in the way that the articles are constructed. There is only a one house legislature. So unlike our Congress today that has two houses, there's only one house and every state gets a single vote. Okay. Um, there is no president. There is no court system. It's literally just this one house legislature where each state has the same vote. So what does the national government do? The answer is not very much. Uh, it can declare war. Um, it can engage in diplomacy with other nations and make treaties. Um, they have the ability to coin money, but they can't do taxes and they can't regulate trade. That is left to the states. Um, so the national government has very little kind of say or authority. And what we actually have happening is we have 13 very different state governments with all different rules and regulations. Uh, and in order to amend the articles, you had to have a unanimous vote, which is pretty impossible in politics. I think we will all agree, especially after the presidential debate that was last night. Oh, Lord. Um, so the weaknesses of the Confederation, as I mentioned, there's really no kind of unified strong voice for the United States. Um, there's also the fact that the United States government is deeply in debt due to the Revolutionary War, but they can't raise money, right, because they can't tax, um, and the only way for them to get money is to ask the states nicely, and the states have their own debt. They don't want to deal with it. Um, there's also trade. 
Um, other nations get really frustrated that there are different rules for trading in like Massachusetts versus Georgia. Uh, it's really confusing. Uh, and then there's the fact that this debt is not just again at the national level, but the state and local level. And this actually leads to Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts um, where farmers led by Daniel Shays, uh, who was a farmer and a veteran of the American Revolution, uh, rose up and they basically argued that the foreclosure process, because a lot of states were trying to raise money for the economy by foreclosing on people who were behind in payments, um, they made the argument that that should stop, right? Because the farmers didn't have the ability. The economy was very depressed. Uh, and they argued that their liberty was being violated. So it took a while for the governor of Massachusetts and armed forces uh, to put down Shays' rebellion. And that's what started getting people to think about how the Articles of Confederation was very flawed and needed to be fixed. And so initially a meeting was called to fix the articles. And then the people who were at that meeting said, you know what, let's just chuck this in the wastebasket and start over. So what's interesting about the Constitution, so the meeting originally to fix the articles comes up with a new version of government entirely. Um, there are 55 delegates at what becomes known as the Constitutional Convention. Um, what's interesting is that most of them are upper class or born into already prosperous families with the exception of Alexander Hamilton. Um, more than half of them had attended college at a time where one tenth of one percent of Americans went to college. One tenth of one percent. Um, half of them were veterans of the American Revolution. Most had participated in previous sort of political meetings involving the states. Uh, and a lot of them were fairly young. About 18 of the delegates were under 40. The youngest delegate was Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey. He was only 26, which makes me feel very unaccomplished because I'm older than that. Um, the oldest person, yeah, 0.1%, thank you, Thomas. The oldest person um, was Benjamin Franklin. He was 81 at this convention, so props to him. All right, we know a lot about the background of the Constitution because James Madison took notes. This was a closed meeting, but James Madison took notes at the Constitutional Convention, um, but they weren't published until after his death. So it wasn't until 1840 that uh, scholars and Americans got to kind of see behind the scenes uh, of the Constitutional Convention. So this is what's happening. This is what they decide on uh, at this meeting. They kind of hash out a new version of government uh, and they decide that they want to ditch um, the only having a one house legislature. And they said, no, we should have three branches of government. Congress, what's the duty of Congress? Does anybody know? Congress does what? We're supposed to do what? What is Congress supposed to do? What's their job? Make laws, right? That's what they're supposed to do. The Senate's been a little uh, behind on considering laws lately. All right, we have the judiciary, right? Which means the court system. And what is their job? You may know. Interpret laws. What's interesting is the Constitution doesn't actually say that about the court system. Um, the court gives themselves the power of judicial review or reviewing laws during the case of Marbury versus Madison. So one of the earliest major Supreme Court cases. So the idea of judicial review that the Supreme Court interprets and kind of has the last say on whether a law is constitutional is actually not in the Constitution. So fun fact for today. And then the executive branch. What does the executive branch do? So we have make laws, interpret laws, enforce laws, right? I'm guessing you're in government 2305 right now, Mary. All right. So yes, enforce the law. Okay. Um, so let's talk about each of these pieces, each of these branches of government. So Congress, how do we represent the states in Congress? 
there were competing ideas about this because remember the Articles of Confederation, each state had a single vote, right? Which states would probably not be okay with continuing that idea that all states have the same vote? What do you think? Which states might not be on board with every state having the same power in Congress? Yes, as Thomas is, is typing states with a large population like New York, okay, they don't like this. And so Virginia actually proposes that we ditch this notion of all states having the same vote and we just apportion votes based on population. So that's the Virginia plan. And so they say, let's make it so that we have the will of the people is represented, right? So puny Rhode Island is not have the same voice in Congress as New York or Virginia. Um, small states don't like that because they feel like they're going to be shouted out. So New Jersey proposes, no, we should have, again, one, uh, we should keep with the Articles of Confederation system, which each state has the same level of power. So Connecticut suggests a compromise where we have one house, the House of Representatives, right, that abides by the Virginia plan. So the number of representatives is based on the state population. That's the House of Representatives. And then one state where, or excuse me, one house, the Senate, where each states have the same number of representatives. And how many senators does each state have? Do you remember? Two, correct. Okay, so that's the Connecticut compromise. We're gonna have two pieces of Congress. One's gonna be based on state population. One, the states have all the same votes. Okay. So that is how Congress is kind of hammered out again as a kind of a discussion between states of different sizes and powers. Um, then there's the issue of judicial appointments. So how are we going to create this court system? Remember the courts, it's not just the Supreme Court, but we also have circuit courts, right? State uh, level courts of different sizes. But for in terms of the national court system, who gets the power to appoint judges? Who gets to appoint them? I hope you guys have been paying attention in the news lately because this is a hot topic on the news. Who appoints judges? The president, correct. However, can he just say, I want this person on the bench and they get there? What has to happen before they can take over this position as judge? The president appoints them. Who is to approve them or confirm them? The Senate, correct. Um, and the reason the Constitution has it for the Senate is again, each state kind of has the same level of representation. So the larger states aren't gonna, you know, strong arm the smaller states on judges, right? So the president says, okay, I want this person as a judge and then Senate has to approve. Okay, so we're seeing that right now, right? Because there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Passed away uh, not that long ago. And then uh, Amy Coney Barrett has been nominated to fill her seat. Right. And in order for her to take that seat, she has to be confirmed by the Senate. So we're going to get to see the Senate confirmation process play out very shortly. Um, I would imagine uh, they will be holding hearings very soon, definitely in October. All right. So that's, again, kind of an example of a check and balance. Right. The executive branch, the president can nominate a judge, but it ha they have to be confirmed by the Senate part of Congress, right? So this is the idea of federalism, that there are different layers of government, right? The national governments, the state governments, and there are checks and balances on the power of each component, right? So there are checks and balances between the national and the state level government authority. There's also checks and balances between these three branches. So when it comes to the president, um, a very interesting thing uh, happens. Uh, they decide that they will create this entity known as the Electoral College. So anybody, can anybody explain to me how the Electoral College works? It is a very complicated thing. Um, and other nations that uh, adopt a constitution similar to ours do not adopt the Electoral College. Anybody know what it is? Or how it works? It's complicated. And we have this discussion about the Electoral College every presidential election cycle. All right, first question. Does the popular vote determine who becomes president?
No, it's not, right? So the popular vote does not determine who becomes president. So Thomas says a uh, means of voting by population, each state is assigned a number, right? Okay, and, and Thomas says, I don't know how this number is given. I will, I will fill you in on that. So the electoral college is what elects the president. Okay, which sounds weird, right? Because you vote. So what happens is each state gets a number of seats in the electoral college determined on their population, right? So a state like Texas, we have way more uh, votes in the electoral college than a state like Delaware. Okay? So it's based on population. So what happens is that each state is allowed to determine how their electors will vote. Most states will do a winner take all approach. So whoever wins the majority of the, the popular vote in that state gets all the state's electoral college votes. Um, some states do what's called proportional. So in other words, if candidate A wins 60% of the vote and candidate B wins 40% of the vote, that's how they split their electoral college votes. I think today there are only two or three states that do it that way. So the states are allowed to determine um, how their electors will vote. And if you see anything uh, in the news about what they call faithless electors, these are electors who go rogue. So if the state law says, like Texas does, um, if you are an elector, you have to vote the way the popular vote goes. Um, and you decide, screw that, I'm going to vote differently. That's what some states call faithless electors, right? They've gone completely off book. Um, and there are some states that have laws that can punish that. But the goal of the Electoral College is set up by the Constitution was to allow independent thinking like that. Basically, the Electoral College exists because the founding fathers were afraid of mob rule. They were afraid of too much democracy. Uh, and so this is kind of set up as a safeguard. Yes, so Thomas chimes in, Texas has 38 Electoral College voters compared to California, who's 55. Each party has the same number of voters from each party. Mm -hmm. Basically, what happens is like in in Texas, right? The Democratic Party, yeah, each party is 269. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party will both pick potential electors, and then based on who wins, that's who gets to send the electors. If that makes sense. So if uh, Donald Trump, who's the Republican uh, candidate for this year, if he wins the state of Texas, the Republican Party is going to go and here are the electors versus if Joe Biden manages to win Texas, which would be quite frankly miraculous uh, given the past couple of election cycles, the way Texas goes, um, then the Democratic Party um, would put forth electors. And by the way, that is a change from the original Constitution. The original Constitution says the number one vote getter in the electoral college is president and the number two is vice president because the constitution was written when political parties did not exist yet. So that creates all kinds of problems uh, for their first couple of elections. So the electoral college actually has to be fixed a couple of times. So if you see um, in the news people arguing for the electoral college to be ditched or to be abolished, a lot of this has to do with the fact that, especially in the last like 20, 30, 40 years, we've had more instances of someone winning the popular vote, but losing the electoral college. And so some people are arguing that the person who gets to be president based on the electoral college is not really representative of who the people want uh, to be president. So that is an interesting conversation. But in order to get rid of the electoral college, we would need a constitutional amendment. All right. So as I already kind of mentioned, the Constitution sets up a division and separation of powers. There are different responsibilities that the national government has versus the state government. Okay. There are also checks and balances between the different branches of government. We already mentioned, right, that the president can appoint um, justices, but Congress has to uh, approve them. Congress can pass bills, right, that a president can veto. Um, the judicial branch, right, the court system can declare a law unconstitutional, and that's kind of a smackdown to Congress, right? So there are different ways that the different branches kind of keep the others in check. So national versus state government, this is more about um, areas of control. So for example, states control regulation of their economies, 
in the state. But when it comes to trade across straight lines, that's the responsibility of the national government, right? Um, or things like education. Education funding is determined by the states, not by the national government. Okay, and the national government can give funding, but the distribution of funding and how it's set up is determined by the states. So any questions on checks and balances? The idea of checks and balances was to avoid tyranny, right? Because nobody in the United States wanted to go back uh, to the environment that they lived in prior uh, to the revolution, right? Of British tyranny, of a government that was too powerful. All right, now slavery is written into the Constitution. The word slavery is not in the Constitution. You will not find it. But anytime you see other persons in the Constitution, that is a reference to slavery. Part of this is because in order to get the southern states on board, northern states had to agree to continue the institution of slavery. Uh, and this is a little bit of a hard sell um, for northern states, which are increasingly shifting away uh, from using slavery. Um, in the end, we have three pieces uh, referring to slavery in the Constitution. The slave trade clause in the Constitution basically uh, prohibits Congress from abolishing the slave trade uh, for, for, for the first 20 years. Uh, the Constitution is in existence. So we can't ban the importation of slaves for at least 20 years, right? It kind of puts pause on that. The fugitive slave clause um, requires that um, states cooperate to return uh, escaped or runaway slaves because they're seen as property, right? They're seen as lost property in the system. And so this requires um, the state has a law that allows slavery. The fugitive slave clause says that state still has to return the escaped slave. So in other words, just because a slave makes it to a free state or a slave without slavery does not mean that they are by default free. Okay. Um, for the first several decades, northern states are going to ignore this. They're just going to be like, nah, that's your problem. We're not cooperating. Okay. Which is why it's going to later be strengthened um, before we get to the Civil War. Then there's the three fifths clause. Anybody know what the three fifths clause does? Anybody have any idea? What is the three fifths clause? It's about counting population. Right. So the three-fifths three clause, as Thomas chimes in, is about counting slaves, right? So your slave population will be counted three-fifths of it, okay? Yes, so slaves are equivalent to three-fifths of a person for voting purposes. So this meant that southern states don't have their population for the House of Representatives just based on the white population, but also three-fifths of the slave population. Northern states are very mad at this because this gives Southerners more votes than they have necessarily free people. Okay, especially states like South Carolina, which by the time the Civil War has like 60% of their population is enslaved, right? So this actually gives Southern states more voice and more representation than their white population would suggest. All right, so the Constitution is hammered out. Um, after they finish, yeah, slaves can't vote to begin with. Why should we be counting them for representation purposes? Exactly. But there is a, a tradition in uh, the Constitution, especially when we're talking about the census, right, that is representing all the population. So in other words, like, for example, El Paso, when we do the census, um, the numbers that we determine for our representation in the Texas uh, legislature and the national legislature is based on the entire population. So not just the voting population. So right, like kids or immigrants, right? People who can't vote, but they're still present, right? They're still represented. All right, so these guys finish hammering out the constitution. They have an epic celebration after they're done. Um, they end up going to the city tavern in Philadelphia 
and racking up a giant bar tab. Uh, they actually uh, consume 45 gallons of booze uh, at this uh, celebration for being done writing the Constitution. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, by far, most of what they're drinking is wine, although there is some cider and some alcoholic punch sprinkled in there. All right, so that's a victory that they finished writing it, but then they actually have to get people to get on board with it. Remember, they were just supposed to fix the Articles of Confederation. They weren't supposed to draft a whole new version of government. Um, so they have to sell people on the Constitution and ratifying or approving it. So this is something that's going to take a bit. Uh, and there's actually, as, as awesome as we consider the Constitution today, um, there were a lot of people who weren't on board with it during this time period. Um, in order for the Constitution to become effective, nine of the 13 states had to approve it or ratify it. Um, so there is this debate. Is the Constitution going to work? Um, is it better than the Articles of Confederation? And so to support the Constitution, we have a series of essays called the Federalist Papers. Um, and the Federalist Papers were published in newspapers across the United States in support of ratifying the Constitution. Uh, and it's written by uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. Alexander Hamilton writes the bulk of these 85 different essays. He writes 50 of them. Okay. Uh, John Jay is like that person in a group presentation who's briefly there and then disappears. He only writes five. But in his defense, he got sick, and that's why he only wrote five. Um, so they're defending the Constitution. Hamilton makes the argument that because of checks and balances and the division of power between the national and the state governments, this would prevent tyranny or government getting too powerful. Madison's essays, even though he doesn't write as much as Hamilton, he only writes 30, um, Madison's ideas are kind of interesting. He says that the way the Constitution is set up will uh, protect minority populations in the United States. So he argued that the bigger the United States got, the more diverse the population uh, that we got, uh, the better the Constitution would function, was his argument. Now, not everybody bought into these arguments in the Federalist Papers. We have lots of people who identify as anti-Federalists or against the Constitutions. Um, they're not as well organized or unified uh, as the authors of the Federalist Papers who all work together. Um, instead, this was a lot of different people who had lots of different complaints about the Constitution. Um, so to give you some examples of people who oppose the Constitution, Patrick Henry, uh, Samuel Adams, Mercy Otis Warren, uh, who wrote under a pen name, the Columbian Patriot. Uh, so it was not actually known until after her death that it was her. Uh, who had written it. Anti-Federalists had a lot of different complaints about the Constitution, but most of them centered around the fact that they felt the Constitution gave the national government too much power. Uh, for them, they argued that the power should be distributed more to the state and local governments. Um, some people who were opposed to slavery took exception to the fact that slavery was accounted for in the Constitution and protected. Um, other people said it's impossible for a large nation to function uh, well um, by only having kind of this one national Congress that instead, you know, like how can you have the same system of laws governing Massachusetts and, you know, South Carolina? Like they are very different uh, states. But the biggest complaint the Anti-Federalists had was that the Constitution did not explicitly say what rights citizens had. Because traditionally in um, Britain, there was this idea of the rights of Englishmen, that there were certain rights you had by virtue of being born free and English. Um, and none of those were in the Constitution. So in the end, what happens is the Constitution squeaks through, is ratified, um, and you can actually see here on this map, the green is where the majority vote for ratification and the purple is the majority against ratification. So you can see really no state for the most part is solidly one color or the other. You can see it's pretty, pretty mixed. 
right? So the Constitution squeaks through in part because of a bargain. The supporters of the Constitution. Ah, OK, I'll answer your question in a second, Thomas. The supporters of the Constitution. Say if you pass it, if you ratify it. We will include a Bill of Rights, a statement of all those rights of Englishmen. We will add that to the Constitution ASAP. So Thomas asked the question, why was New York so against ratification? Um, for New York, part of this is New York has always been, uh, throughout the colonial period, New York is kind of neutral. Um, they're sort of neither northern nor southern. Um, they always kind of tried to stay out of it. So like there were actually a lot of loyalists in New York. Uh, and for them, they're focusing on things like trade and the economy. And there is a concern uh, amongst the anti-federalists that um, if we had a national government, um, that that would kind of interfere with state level economies and attempts to, for example, uh, relieve debt. Um, and that would favor the rich. So in other words, the poor farmers who started Shays Rebellion were likely anti-federalists as well because they saw like this new sort of powerful national government as kind of squashing some like early attempts by states to kind of cancel out debts um, by poor people uh, in response to Shays Rebellion. Uh, so really it's mostly kind of about the economy and the balance of power. There was this concern in New York um, that uh, this would affect their livelihood. Hopefully that answers your question. Awesome, I'm getting a nod. OK. So as promised, after the Constitution is ratified, uh, Congress introduces the Bill of Rights, which have to be ratified themselves. So these are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, um, one of the arguments that Madison made against a Bill of Rights was he said, look, if you do a Bill of Rights, you're stating what rights you have. But that kind of implies like those are the only rights you have. So like that was his criticism. Why write it down? Number one, um, because that might limit the notion of what rights you have. Number two, anybody who's intent upon squashing your rights is going to ignore it being on paper. Okay. Um, nevertheless, to get the votes needed to ratify the Constitution, um, the Federalists agree to add the 10 amendments. All right, so amendments one through seven really kind of echo the traditional rights of Englishmen, right? The First Amendment is probably seen as the most important one to us today. It was not necessarily seen as the most important one back then. First Amendment does what? It does a whole list of things. I may want to mention some of the things covered by the First Amendment. Freedom of. I'll give you a hint. <clears throat> Banning TikTok might be a violation of what freedom? Speech. Yes. Assembly, press, religion. Good. You guys are awesome. You got it. So speech, religion, press, and assembly, all covered under the First Amendment. Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. Third Amendment, don't, you can't quarter troops in someone's house, which seems weird, but remember, that was a big beef uh, by the revolution. Who oh, no. knew? PowerPoint went away. Um, while I'm working on that, the fourth through the sixth amendments are about trials, right? What rights you have in trials and criminal prosecutions. Uh, and then the Seventh Amendment is about cruel and unusual punishment, that you have a right to not be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. Okay. Then the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are really interesting. So the Ninth and Tenth Amendments basically um, are what we call the Elastic Amendments. So these are the amendments that Congress kind of builds in to give more flexibility. So the Ninth Amendment says that people are entitled to rights that are not specifically stated in the Constitution or its amendments. So for example, there's no right to privacy in the Constitution, right? 
do we expect today that we have some right to privacy? Yeah. And a lot of that is from case law before the Supreme Court, and they make the argument that that's covered under uh, the Constitution, under the Ninth Amendment. And then the Tenth Amendment says any powers or responsibilities not explicitly given to the national government belong to the states. Okay. So the Constitution mentions three groups of people, the people, which means citizens. Uh, and interestingly enough, the Naturalization Act of 1790 specifically says white people are eligible, eligible to become citizens. So that kind of rules out other folks. It mentions Native Americans. It defines Native Americans as basically foreign nations. So in other words, not citizens. And then other persons or slaves. Okay. Those are kind of the three classes of people uh, expressed by the Constitution. And then one thing I do kind of want to wrap up with is talking about how the Constitution can be changed, because that's also written into the Constitution. What's the process for updating the Constitution or modifying it? So there are two ways that um, we can call a constitutional convention, which is required to amend the Constitution. So if Congress decides it's necessary and they vote two thirds of each, the House and the Senate votes, that can kick off a constitutional convention. Or if the states, the state legislatures, again, by two thirds, decide it's necessary to call a constitutional convention, then that can trigger one. Now, here's what I'm gonna say. If we call a constitutional convention, it is a free for all. In other words, maybe we call a constitutional convention because we want to say to get rid of the electoral college maybe that we have like a goal like that right like one thing we want to fix as soon as you call a constitutional convention people can suggest other things too it can become like a kitchen sink uh, of different suggestions so any proposed amendments that are agreed upon at this constitutional convention which again representatives come from all of the states any of these amendments that come out of a constitutional event uh, um, I have not enough coffee today constitutional convention um, have to be ratified again by 75% of the states. Um, most amendments do not have a timetable. So in other words, they don't have a deadline by which they have to be ratified. Uh, for example, one of our more recent amendments actually was first proposed like over 200 years before it actually passed. Um, the big exception to this no timetable rule is the Equal Rights Amendment that was proposed in the 1970s. We talk about this in History 1302. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment was given a deadline. And because 75% of the states did not hit that deadline, it was considered dead. But then an interesting thing has happened in that since the deadline, a couple of states have moved to ratify it, even though technically this amendment is dead. Um, and Virginia became kind of the last required state um, in, in order to hit that 75% mark. But then this becomes a question of, can, you, can we actually do this, right? Does it actually get added to the constitution? The short answer is no. Um, there are a couple of states that decided to take back the ratification vote. Is that allowed? Don't know, it's never happened before. Um, can states continue to ratify after a deadline? Don't know, it's never happened before. So it's been some interesting questions about ratification and amendments for sure. So in other words, if you wanna change something like the right to bear arms, right? This is not something that can be unilaterally changed by a president or by a Congress even. Um, or by a Supreme Court, right? Whatever is in the Constitution is very difficult to change. It requires a formal process to go through and change it. Um, and then whatever is in the Constitution then becomes the standard which the court system looks at. So this is why I give an example of a bad idea of an amendment. So let's say you love tacos. Who doesn't love tacos, right? I'm sure some people don't but we love tacos, right? Um, let's say that you loved tacos so much, you wanted to enshrine Taco Tuesday into the Constitution. 
Okay, go with me here. So let's say you put that in the Constitution and your amendment says something along the lines of all Americans shall celebrate taco Tuesday by consuming, they must consume tacos. Okay, so if that was in the Constitution, right, if that was successfully passed, let's say we find one person who doesn't like tacos, who doesn't want to eat tacos on Taco Tuesday, and they try to challenge this in court. Because it's in the Constitution, the justices will say, sorry, Constitution says you have to eat tacos on Tuesday. Now, could we debate what is a taco? Yes, we could. Is, uh, I forget the name of it, but there's, I've seen it in the, the grocery store. Like there's this like ice cream sandwich that looks like a taco. Is that a taco? It's a hot dog a taco, because it's open, right? It's wrapped around something. Like what is a taco? Okay, what is the difference between a burrito and a taco, for example? So you see how like there are some things you probably don't want to put in the Constitution, like Taco Tuesday. Um, so that would be an example of something that maybe that's better as a law, right? Because if Congress passes that law and you don't want to eat tacos, like you have a chance of getting that overturned, right? Because it's not in the Constitution. There's a different barrier. So you want to be really careful about what we put in the Constitution because it's not easy to change. Um, in fact, only one constitutional amendment has ever been undone, and it took another amendment to do it. Does anybody know what that amendment is or what it was about? Only one amendment has ever been overturned, and it took another amendment to repeal it. Hint, it is about something you drink when you are of age, hopefully. It was, yeah, well, you're close in time period. It was initially, the, the amendment was introduced in 1919, and then it was repealed in 19, I want to say 33 or 34. Just about a type of beverage, which I am not drinking. I have water today. Yes, prohibition of alcohol, right. That is the only amendment. Yes, clearly I mean apple juice. I mean, it, it's it's fall. It's I, I'm not going to lie. I bought apple cider at the grocery store the other day because that is fall to me. But yes. Um, so alcohol, right? They decided to have a constitutional amendment banning the sale and production of alcohol. And then they decided that was a bad idea and they got rid of it over a decade later. So these are some examples, right? The Constitution is there. It's allowable to change, but to change it requires a lot of attempt and a lot of effort. Okay. 